Thank you, everybody, for, for having me and, uh, and giving me a little slice of your time, uh, even though it's uh, in lunch. Um, I apologize in advance for the pompous title. I couldn't come up with any other good one like general software engineering talk. So, um, What I hope to kind of cover um, is uh, a little bit of my background, what I do for, for a living and what I do for Google, um, and talk a little bit about uh, software engineering as a career. Um, so what it's like you know, once you get out and it's, you know, and it's a job, not, uh, not just something um, that uh, you're playing around with. Um, kind of like where things are in the industry and um, and what do I think things, you know, what the next 10 years or so are going to look like, you know, what's going to be important to some of your students. Um, so when you're talking about computer science and, you know, well, what are you signing up for? And um, <coughs> so my background, my name is Tony Rippey. Um, I am an engineer at Google, uh, a, like a real engineer. I, I, I'm not a PR person or anything. I sit at a desk and I type and I, I work on software. Um, I am an engineer and a manager. I, I um, run a team uh, within a group called Cluster Infrastructure. Um, that, that requires a little bit of explanation. Um, I don't work on any of the things that you normally see through Google. I don't ha um, what you see on Google Maps or the Google search page. Um, the stuff that I write are actually under the covers because in order to make those work, Google requires a lot of computing power, way more than can ever be given by a single computer. And in fact, Google has lots and lots and lots of computers all over the world. And my team is actually responsible for uh, making sure that that works well. That when um, there's uh, computation that needs to be done, that it can be broken up and run on multiple machines um, you know, to, for performance reasons, so that you can break, break up a big problem into smaller bits that can be run in parallel. Um, there's also uh, aspects of failure, that if some machines don't respond, or if you lose power in one location, that the, that same work can be done and um, done somewhere else and so that we don't interrupt the end user's experience um, so that hopefully you never see the Google homepage go down even though all sorts of things could be happening behind the scenes. There could be a fire in a building, who knows what. Um, I work on trying to make sure that that all runs smoothly. Um, before coming to Google, um, I was a bit of an entrepreneur. I was a co-founder of a company called Cycle Computing which uh, helped companies um, take tasks that started out on a single machine and got bigger and bigger and to the point where it no longer ran on a single machine and needed to, you know, go to multiple machines, and that's, that's a kind of a hard problem to solve. Um, before that, um, I was also a consultant. I worked with uh, large companies like some finance here in the New York area, um, Hartford Life, and a bunch of others. So I want to talk a little bit about Google, um, because there's a lot of misconceptions. Like, everybody knows what Google is, right? Uh, I've seen the homepage. Uh, we actually do quite a lot. We're not trying to be a search company. We're not trying to do maps. I mean, our, our mission, as stated by our founders, is actually something a little bit different. It's to organize the world's information to make it universally, universally accessible. Um, and that is more than just web pages or trying to find pages on the web. Um, there's all kinds of information. The world's information is a big thing, right? There's um, just today, uh, before this talk, um, the, the dean was here you know, showing me some of the, uh, some. Uh, using Google technologies to look at microscope slides, like uh, samples, and, and be able to see samples uh, at, at arbitrary resolution. Um, that counts as the world's information. Um, we have historical documents. We've got, um, if you guys have seen the sky map, the Google sky map, like there's astronomy, all sorts of things that don't fit into uh, the, the narrow categories of being a web page someplace. And our goal is to try and make all that available to everyone. Part of everyone is not just the United States. Um, we try and make the information um, that's out there available to people of different languages, of different cultures. Um, uh, one of the th projects we were talking about is Google does a lot of work in Africa where we try and make web search available to people that don't have internet. And we do that through SMS on cell phones, on cheap cell phones. Uh, and we have a, a lot of projects going on. Well, what about the other stuff? We're more than just web search, right? We've got mobile phones, the Android uh, operating system, which is bigger, you know, which is big now. Uh, Self-driving cars. We, you see a lot of us on t standing up for internet censorship and, and you know, the whole China incident that uh, we were running into. Um, High-speed internet in Kansas City. Um, so we, get, we have all these types of large projects that don't really sit within a normal scope of, of our core business. And so why are we doing all that? Uh, it's not because we're trying to take over the world. It's not because we want to be a monopoly or anything like that. And you know, yes, we make money, and we like making money, um, but it's not to, um, to, to increase our profits to some insane number. Um, Google engineers, everybody that I work with, joins that company because they want to make a difference. And we feel that Google is a company that can make a difference and kind of try and change things on it. And it is a very different kind of company uh, than what you would normally get. 
through like a, a bank or um, or even Microsoft or um, another software technology company. Um, first of all, there's no suits. This is the sort of thing that would wear to work at, at every day. Um, it's Part of the, the culture there is formed because uh, uh, Larry and Sergey, the, our two founders, were uh, engineering students at Stanford. And they are at the top, they've retained that. All of our managers are engineers and we're very um, data driven and focused on trying to make things work. Um, and that, that is part of the company culture. And everybody here, or everybody at Google, uh, wants, to, wants to change the world and make it a better place and to do that through technology. And it, it sounds cheesy, but honestly, that is our goal. And a lot of things that we do reflect that. So that said, I want to talk a little bit about software engineering, uh, which is my day job. Um, I, so the, 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 the program that, that Google uh, runs to help sponsor th uh, events like this are called uh, Computer Science for High School, it's CS4HS. Um, computer Science um, has a definition of using the theoretical, uh, the, what is the quote here, sorry, the theoretical foundations of information and computation, uh, blah, 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 and its application in computer systems. It's about information and taking information and how to manipulate it, right? Which is a very different thing than what people tend to think of with computer science. Like, I want to make a video game, or I, uh, um, you know, I want to search a database. Um, so I love this quote. It was by a famous computer scientist back in the, uh, in the 50s. Um, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. I mean, the big thing to understand here is that a computer is a tool. Right? Most of what computer scientists and software engineers do is trying to figure out how can we ma best make use of that tool. Um, how, like, it's not easy to represent information sometimes in computers, as you guys might have found uh, with working with the Raspberry Pi and, and writing some, some of the Python programs. Um, it's about how to take what you want to have happen and, and use the tool to make that work and the process by which you do that, um, which is a bit of thing of just being all about computers. And so I'm a software engineer, and specifically what it means is taking some of the, the, the things that are learned through computer science and the study of algorithms and data structures and programming languages, and learning how to solve uh, real world problems with those, and trying to do that in a way that is reliable, um, that you, it's an iterative process around trying to make things better as you go along, and to learn the practices and the professional practices by which you do that. Um, so one common misconception. Um, Computer engineers don't sit at their computers all day. I don't show up for work, like sit down at my computer and type, 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 type until the end of the day and then go home. Um, so a, a good question is, okay, if I, you know, why, why is that? What, so what do I do in my job? So here's a quiz. And let, I just want to see what people think here. So as I sit down, if I had a full day work, right, I'm sitting there and I have no other distractions, and I'm going to sit down and, and, and write some code. How many lines of code do you think an average engineer actually produces in a day? Right. Well, that's that feeds into it, right? Any guesses? Yeah. That's true. Um, we did a study about this, and the average Google engineer only produces about ten or twenty lines of code a day, which seems like an enormous waste. Um, but you have asked then, well, what are you doing, right? If I'm not writing uh, lines of code all day, what am I doing? And I'm doing a lot. Um, there, more goes into software development than just sitting there and actually writing code. And there's an enormous amount. Like for every line of code that you write um, at Google, we tend to write at least 10 lines of code to test it and make sure it's working properly. Um, there's just trying to decide what you want to write to begin with. And there's always a certain amount of debate around that. Like, well, what features should you have? Um, what goes into a release? What doesn't go into a release? Are you working on the right things? Um, you look over somebody's shoulder, so, like, so one developer is working on a, um, on a piece of software. Well, you want to make sure that other people can, can support that and make changes to it. Um, making sure that the code is readable, fixing bugs, um, actually deploying the software that you write. There's a lot of stuff that uh, engineers do um, that doesn't actually have to do with writing computer programs. And so sometimes when you look at a curriculum at a, at a university, uh, for a computer science university, there will be a whole bunch of stuff about algorithms and data structures and databases and all sorts of uh, abstract topics. And then there will be one little class and they're like software engineering practices. And it's usually like a 400 level course or something. And that's usually the one people don't like. And because it's, it's, uh, very, it seems very bureaucratic. But then you get out in the real world and it turns out that one little class is the most realistic and the most important uh, um, for your day job. But, 
so some of the skills that are important. So what sort of things we look for in, uh, in software engineers. Um, so there's a certain amount of patience, creativity. Um, so when you're trying to tackle a problem, it's not always clear, like when you have a problem that you want to solve, how you can solve that with a computer. So there's a certain amount of problem solving and creativity that has to go in to be able to make that, uh, make that work. Um, it has to be somebody who enjoys challenges, otherwise, you know, nothing's easy, right? So with a lot of jobs, um, it's not like a factory line where you did this something yesterday and you can use your experience from yesterday and do the same thing today and then do the same thing tomorrow and gain a certain amount of experience that way. Usually, uh, most of the problems that you face when trying to write uh, computer software is unique in that you're trying to do something new. So you can't always look at an example of something someone else has done and copy that. You have to be able to take practices and approaches and try and, and s figure out what's the best way to do the problem at hand. And, and there's not a lot of um, repetition there. You have to like to, uh, to run experiments Some, uh, quite often. In fact, I would say the majority of the cases is you'll write a piece of software, it will work, you'll put it out there, and you'll realize that you weren't solving the right problem or it doesn't work as well as you would have hoped. And you always, it's an iterative process. You always have to go back and, and do it again and do it again and, and always trying to improve upon what you're working on. So those are some of the things that we try and look for. And of course, math logic and um, uh, reasoning skills. I love throwing this slide up there, uh, especially if there's math teachers uh, in this class. I don't know how many of you guys are, are math teachers. Um, so hiring somebody for a, to be a good software engineer is a hard problem. And this is an example of a recruiting drive that was done around two, the year 2000 by Google in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. Um, you'll notice that Google is not anywhere on this billboard. Um, this is put on the 101 if anybody's been out in California. And so everybody commuting into San Francisco into Silicon Valley would see this in their morning commute and when they're stuck in rush hour traffic. And it's a problem. Like find the, the, the first 10 digit prime number found in consecutive digits of E dot com, right? So what kind of person do you think would respond to this billboard, right? It's somebody that would be sitting there kind of bored in their car and said, well, huh, that's kind of a hard problem. Like, you can't look that up online. Try searching for, well, now you can because this is a famous example, so I'm sure somebody's posted it online. But at the time, this wasn't online on any, uh, any, any place. Um, this is not the sort of problem you would ever do, like a, a t traditional math problem. And trying to solve this is actually very difficult. Um, so we were looking for people that, first of all, are interested, that like puzzles, and then have the ability to be able to take that and say, well, how would I find the first 10-digit prime? Uh, and you know, be able to search that. And it turns out this was actually step one, right? So at the end, there's a 10-digit number dot com, and that was a web address. And they would take you to another page that contained another problem. And there's actually three or four stages of this. And, and by the time you got to the fourth stage, you basically said, call this number. And then you, you got an interview, and you know, usually <laughs> people got, got hired. So once, once that became known, then this became very popular. But, uh, <laughs> um, this, uh, but that gives you an idea of what we kind of look for. We look for uh, motivation, so, you know, being self-motivated. Somebody had to look at this and actually want to do the work, want to solve problems, be interested in hard challenges. And this is a hard thing to do if you guys want to try it in Python on the <laughs> after you get back. Um, so that said, I mean, Google is obviously a technology-focused company, but it's not just Google that is hiring software engineers, right? Um, pretty much any industry that you look at these days is hiring software engineers. Um, all businesses have some sort of computer component, um, like all like businesses, this, even McDonald's. You'll see that all McDonald's has all these uh, computers that uh, they track who's ordering what, which all goes into real-time metrics and logistics, ordering, um, you know, marketing materials, and all that gets fed in. It's very much, even though it's just flipping burgers, it's, uh, there's a lot of technology behind it. Um, grocery stores are an amazing amount of uh, technologies in grocery stores. I actually, uh, used a coworker of mine used to be work for Stop and Shop. And the amount of data analysis that they do to figure out how to stock the shelves and when the things need to be delivered and what's going to be hot at different times of years, uh, a lot of thought goes into that. So basically, any industry that you're on has computers in it and has uh, positions. So that's why I think personally that um, computers are a great career to get into because they're not going away anytime soon. And they're very critical to the businesses that, uh, that, that use them well. On top of that, the jobs are hard to fill. I mean, many of you may have heard about the whole battles in Congress about uh, visas and, and, um, and everything. Part of the, the trouble there is that it's very difficult to hire people into our roles. I mean, you saw the extremes that Google went to to try and find good software engineers. Um, it's, it's hard to find. And Unfortunately, rather than um, enrollment going up in computer science in, in colleges, enrollment is actually going down, 
which is hugely worrying for the U.S. economy because we have all these people, these jobs that are available that need to be filled at a time when there's, there's chronic unemployment. And there's just not the people that have the skills to fill those roles. And um, that's where you guys come in. You're kind of priming the next uh, generation of students that are going to be coming up and become the, the engineers for uh, uh, inside of technology that, uh, that you know, the U.S. businesses need to be able to move forward and become better at what they do. Um, and these are just some examples of recent examples from people complaining about the fact that they, they're not there to fill. By the way, as a plug, I'd like to point out that at the, and you may not be able to see it here. At the hardest to fill in 2012, teachers was on there as well. So <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to find good teachers as well. So The, the next part of my talk is uh, I mentioned that uh, the future aspect of it, right? So if you are going you know, to help students uh, move into this, uh, into this career, what kind of things do they want to expect? What do they need to, uh, to know? I don't have a crystal ball, and nobody does either. Um, the, the questions that I usually get when I go to tech conferences and that sort of thing, or when I'm meeting other people, I get these three questions, right? They, they, they think I'm in a special position to know what's going on in the world and technology. And I get, okay, well, what's the future going to bring? What's coming up next? And, you know, well, what's going to happen next? What's the next big thing? Right? I get this all the time. And this annoys me and a lot of the other engineers I work with because they're the wrong questions. Um, the person asking that question should be thinking and, and asking a different set of questions. And I think the questions that they should be asking are, what problems need to be addressed? Like, so what, what is being done today that it, that's, not, that's not good? Like, what don't I like about the way computers work, that the way that healthcare works, that, you know, whatever it is? Um, what do we want the world to look like? Like, so 10 years from now, um, do, you know, how do we want mobile phones to, to, to look? I, do we want to solve the traffic problem of commuting into the city? Maybe self-driving cars, that's sort of a, a arrangement. And the, the last and the most important bit, how do we make that happen? So you've got a problem, and it's usually challenging problems and hard and gnarly problems with many aspects uh, to it. And we want to try, I mean, the important aspect here is that we want people that can take a look at that, tackle the problem, and, and make progress. You can't always get to your end goal, but you can, you can push things forward and move along the way. And I think that last bit is the critical piece for, for engineers and what we certainly look for. I can tell you, I can't tell you what's, you know, what the future is going to look like. It's always changing. But I can tell you what some of the things my coworkers are working on and some, some particularly exciting areas right now. Um, you guys uh, it, uh, may have heard things about running in the cloud or the cloud. It's a very ambiguous term. Um, but what that is, is it's kind of a realization um, that computers can be run more efficiently and more reliably um, in central locations and with people watching it 24-7, right? One thing that we have right now in industries is that every major company that you go into somewhere has a building full of computers and they have to hire people that, that sit there and watch all these computers uh, and make sure that they're up and running properly. Or if you're a small business, um, everybody has one under their desk or they have a couple in the office. Um, but nobody really knows you know, how to keep the thing running and then it'll break sometime and they have to call somebody in to take a look at it. Um, and that's not great. So. This, this whole cloud effort is a way about taking uh, computers and trying to run them more efficiently, um, trying to keep them in central locations so that you can deliver power more efficiently, you can, you can save power. Uh, you think about it, all the people that have uh, uh, computers running under their desk at a giant bank, most of the time all those computers are sitting idle, they're not doing anything, but they're still sucking power from the, from the grid and the company pays for that electricity. We're burning fossil fuels, causing pollution to, burn, to generate the electricity that's running those computers that are sitting there doing nothing. And um, it's more efficient to be able to have something in central place so that you can use the computing resources that you have um, when you need it. And we can sh turn off computers that aren't needed because there's not the demand. Kind of the way that a, uh, an electric company like Con Ed, they don't spin up their generators. They don't run their generators 24-7. Um, they only run uh, generators when they actually need it to produce the power uh, to meet demand. Um, so that's some, some of the efforts that uh, we're working on at Google and a lot of other companies are. Um, we're definitely focused right now on the post-PC area. Um, or ear, sorry. Um, things are moving away from the desktop, right? So a lot of people have desktops, but way more people have phones, feature phones, or tablets, or other computing devices that they can carry with them. They're smaller and maybe less powerful, um, but um, are very versatile. Um, in fact, another thing that, uh, that uh, we were looking at uh, earlier was that uh, uh, my wife happens to be a phys ed teacher in the Bronx, and, uh, and he was showing me a program where they can actually watch somebody shooting a basketball or throwing a pitch. 
and through a tablet it can capture pictures and trace the parabola of the, uh, of the uh, devices. I mean, that, that's incredibly powerful. You'd never be able to do that with a desktop. And a lot of the navigation features of a phone, you would never be able to do that with a computer. And we expect, at least, that computers are going to move away from the desktop and, and m far more work is going to be done on mobile devices and not just phones, right? There's a whole set of wearable devices that are coming out, and it's not science fiction, really. Apple, later this year, is going to be coming out with a wristwatch um, that is a computer and can so store all your contact information and perhaps make calls. I don't know. I don't work at Apple, but we'll see. I'm sure uh, it'll be a shiny new thing and everybody will love it. But um, uh, Google has the Google Glass, which are the, the glasses that have a heads-up display in it, um, which is one step on the way of where, like actual wear devices. Where we really want to get to is something like a contact lens um, that has a kind of a heads-up display in it that can communicate with a phone wirelessly or a device like that. Not, not impossible. Um, the technology uh, is there for, for some aspects of it. Uh, definitely expensive and, uh, and you know, it's not ready for a market anytime soon. But that's the sort of thing that people are working on. Like, what does it mean if computers were just, you know, part of you or your daily life? Um, machine learning. Um, so I mentioned before things like Stop and Shop, right? It turns out that all these companies bought computers and have gigantic databases where they're collecting information about all aspects of their business. But having lots and lots and lots of information isn't always a good thing if you can't do anything with it, right? So people have been collecting data for years, and they're trying to, to use that, that information to be able to, um, to find, find out, for instance, for Stop Shop, what do I need to put on my shelves? And that's a hard problem to solve. And um, you may have heard of big data and, and problems like that. That's um, machine learning and a lot of business intelligence and business analysis that, or data analysis that uh, is going on right now and trying to come up with good ways of doing that and making it easier than it, it has been in the past is a big challenge. Um, something a little bit closer to you guys, rethinking higher education. Um, the university professors in the room made, uh, I might have thoughts on this one, but um, so there are some things that um, cl you know, classrooms are good for and there's some things that aren't. Um, and trying to make education and educational resources available to anybody, anytime um, for low cost um, is a big goal for a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of people at Google. There's one guy, famous one, uh, Craig Silverstein, who is Go employee number three after the first two founders at Google that left to work on the Khan Academy um, because he really believed in its mission and trying to make uh, computers and technology available to people that would not normally have access to high-end educations like Stanford or MIT. You can get an MIT education at home these days. Um, there's lots of courses that are online. Um, I mean, it requires motivation to be able to go and do that and encouragement. And that's, that's actually where teachers come in. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of that. But trying to make uh, some of this uh, information available is a big goal for people that I'm working on. Another thing that's kind of changing is microfinance. Um, personal loans are trying to fund um, the development in uh, a lot of places that don't have the banking and financial infrastructure that the United States has. Um, I mean, we have a lot of businesses and small businesses and, uh, you know, the, Capitalism works here because of a, a lot of infrastructure that we have in place that doesn't exist in a lot of companies or a lot of countries. Um, and microfinance uh, projects like uh, Kiva, I don't know if you guys ever looked at that, or Kickstarter, where um, people are funding other people and projects, um, are, is another area that people like to work on. So. Next, the next question is, okay, well, um, the, ne the next group of engineers, the future engineers, um, what kind of things do, I tried to brainstorm about what, what advice I would give, and that's, that's a hard thing. I don't have the right answers, and I'm not an educator, so I'm not going to tell you the right way to teach this or anything like that. Um, but some of the things that I, I thought of, like the big thing is that um, I notice, I, and I see that with my own kids, um, people look at a computer and they see a web browser, and it's all shiny and all very polished. Um, it's too shiny and polished, right? It's too much that you just point and click and you type and, the, mat and the, the right answer magically appears when you type it in the Google search bar. Um, I think a big lesson that I wish, we, I mean, I could teach my own kids and others is that it's not magic. All this has to work and it's built up from building blocks and, and a lot of effort went into making these things function and learning how they work and learning that it's not magic. Opening up a computer and playing with it like, oh, what does this do? You know, ripping it apart is something a lot of people don't do anymore. And uh, I think that's one thing that I would love to encourage um, in, in younger kids. The how did it work? Um, problem solving. I mean, everybody and their mother hates word problems, right? Like, that's uh, what my daughter dreads in, in her math classes. And, and 
and there's always been a lot of pushback on that, but I think that's the more important problem, right? Um, I think a lot of times the most valuable experiences that I had growing up um, were not when I had a, a steps to follow, like a recipe, right? It was that I had something that I wanted to accomplish and that I wanted to do, and I had to figure out um, how to do that with whatever I had available at the time. Um, and I think that's a valuable lesson. Uh, Hands-on work is definitely um, the way to go because you learn so much more than just what you intended to, right? Um, I, I'm a little disappointed with li libraries, believe it or not. Um, back in my, like when I was growing up, you had to go to a card catalog. You're looking for a book and you had to search through and you would see all sorts of related things um, while you're digging through the card catalog. And even when you tried to go to the shelf, like you'd be looking for a book, um, but you would see like a whole row of books right next to it of similar topics. And you sit there and explore for a little while. And I'm a little, uh, I, I'm sorry to see that go away because now it's, it's way too easy to, to load up Amazon and get exactly the book you're looking for and that's it. Or look it up on the computer and like, oh, I want this reference number, this Dewey Decimal number, and go get my book and then walk away. Um, I think uh, projects, and especially messy, ill-defined projects where there's no right answer, um, are the type of things that students can go and they'll end up learning all kinds of stuff um, that may not even be related to the topic of, of what they're working on. And I'm a big believer in that. Um, so one thing that I like to tell um, teachers is that a lot of times um, you guys may not have a lot of experience with the technology. I mean, you're learning Raspberry Pi today, and there's uh, other projects called Scratch uh, that you may or may not have uh, dealt with. Um, a lot of things that I've heard in the past, I've done a couple of these, uh, these types of talks, and um, a lot of things I've heard in the past is that people are a little bit nervous um, teaching them and going through these as projects in a, in a class because they themselves don't know it that well. That's okay. Like, like I said, the, the valuable part here is exploring and, and, and going through it. Um, sometimes if a, if a student runs into a problem, um, you know, just working through it um, allows you to, uh, you know, to, to learn a lot more and uh, get more out of it. And, it's, and, and sometimes it's okay not to have the answers. There's, uh, you can always look it up. Uh, then extracurricular activities. I don't know how many, uh, is, has anyone here been involved with the first robot competition by any chance? Do you guys know what it, uh, know what it is? So, all right, well here, I'll, I'll give you a, a little advertisement here. There are all sorts of, of projects and programs that are out there. Um, there's this really great guy that I had the pleasure of, uh, of meeting and, and, and getting to know uh, by the name of Dean Kamen. Um, he's an inventor, a serial inventor that does amazing things. Um, he invented the first robotic arm for veterans coming back from the war. He invented the insulin pump. He, uh, he's most famous for the Segway, that little two-wheeled uh, like uh, thing that rolls around the cities. Um, but he um, took a look at, he, his kids at the time, and he saw that in the schools, so much attention was given from early years all the way through high school to sports. Um, people would start sending their kids to basketball camp when they're in kindergarten and ridiculous things like that. And at the end of it, you get to the end of your high school career, and you are really good at basketball, and you never play basketball again except maybe in a side league when you're older, right? Um, he said, what if we could do the same thing for engineers? Like, we, I want to make engineering a sport. And so the solution he came up with for this is this first robot competition. He started up in New Hampshire where he um, was based, it was either Vermont or New Hampshire, I'm not sure. Um, and he tried to come up with engineering challenges and tried to have s local schools put teams together to compete about how well they were able to build a device to solve a particular problem. And it's grown and grown over the years and now it's a nationwide um, competition where every year um, you, you schools sign up and um, they get teams together. There's a problem, like uh, last year, I believe it was basketballs, um, that you had to have a machine that could take and shoot a basket and make two, two points. That's at the high school level. The younger kids have e easier challenges. And then they get a kit. And it's a kit of parts, which may or not be, uh, may not be used. There's not a lot of instructions. And an important part is they usually pair up uh, with somebody from, from uh, the industry or somebody that might have done that. Uh, if it's a parent, it could be somebody at a local company. Um, or somebody that has experience with this, and that is most, mostly in a mentor role. And you put these projects together, and then you get together with other teams from other schools and compete. And it's, it's amazing. Like uh, last year, down at the, the Javits Center, they had a regional uh, competition. And I don't know if any of you guys saw it, it was amazing. Our like, school did it. Your school did it? Yeah, we have an old girls' school. We have an old girls' team. Excellent. Yeah. It's yeah. Great. And it's a lot of fun, right? Like, uh, the we have robotics team. Yeah. Robotics team. Yeah, yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, those sort of things are, are just fantastic. And encouraging that is a way to kind of make engineering fun and practical and hands-on. And uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in a lot of that. 
Another thing is if your school has a website, um, sometimes the kids may not know how to do it, but uh, just, you know, if somebody shows an aptitude for computers and is interested in that sort of thing, let them run it. Um, let them do things at the school and, uh, and get, like, again, hands-on experience. And, and that will fuel kind of interest in, in the area. Um, that's some of my thoughts. But uh, thank you for letting me come and uh, present. And, uh,